Well, thanks, Joseph, and to the entire Orchard leadership team for inviting me back again this year. Thanks to each of you for coming out as well. This one is uh, being videotaped, and so I'm going to stay. They don't want me to roam too far, so I'll roam a little bit that way and not too far that way. So if you'll uh, forgive me. Jeannie and I were joking. Jeannie uh, McMains and I have been friends for a number of years uh, through her work with Focus on the Family and, and some other ministries. And, uh, of course, Jeannie is an attorney. I'm not and I don't even play one on TV. But um, uh, Jeannie, of course, uh, oftentimes will end up being relegated the technical you know, type of uh, presentation. But today, she got the one more about legacy and family, uh, intergenerational mentoring and reconciliation, which is oftentimes what I talk about. In fact, last year at this uh, Inspire Giving Conference, I spoke on the topic of the stewardship of your family and business legacy. But um, what Joseph and the Orchard team found out is that there are a lot of ministries that are really, who are at the Inspire Giving Conference, who are a little bit newer at the whole idea of planned giving. And so they don't want to just know what can I do with, you know, people with hundreds of millions of dollars and helping them in, in the way that we do. They want to know how can we find more donors that we can do bread and butter planned giving. And so that's what uh, Joseph and the leadership team asked me to speak on today. Um, so this is identifying current and deferred gift planning opportunities using what I call the seven significant gift triggers. And uh, unlike Jeannie, by the way, let me ask a question. How many of you were born after 1980? Would you raise your hand nice and high? Three, after 1980. Okay, so we have three millennials in the room. And you all saw uh, Jeannie's statistics about millennials and how they think and also they, they want all the pictures and no bullet points, right? So because this audience is primarily made up of Xers and Boomers and maybe some builders as well, uh, I've got an old school presentation for you here. So if you'll forgive me. So let's talk about kingdom collaboration. Why current giving, deferred giving, and major donor relationships are each important. As Joseph shared, I've worked with a lot of major ministries and what I've seen is that in many cases, uh, they have silos within the organization. There's the major donor group, there's the planned giving group, there's the you know, uh, you know, donor marketing and all of that. And sometimes there's not a lot of collaboration between them. In addition, sometimes there's not a lot of collaboration with the attorneys, financial advisors, and CPAs uh, of the donors. And one of the things that I've found over, over, after over 30 years of doing this is that without that type of collaboration, Excellently planned gifts sometimes get killed in the process. You could have spent time with the donor, have understood what they want to accomplish, laid out a perfectly good plan, and then told the donor, here, take this to your attorney and take this to your financial advisor and CPA and implement it. And oftentimes what happens? Nothing. They go, why do you want to give all that money to charity anyway? And, and isn't that you know, so complex? You know, let's just keep it simple. And their form of simple is less money goes to God's kingdom and either more money goes to the kids and grandkids, which is not necessarily bad, but it can be bad if it's too much money. Or uh, oftentimes more money goes to federal estate taxes, which we saw before. So today we want to talk about how major gift officers, uh, development officers, and plan giving officers can work collaboratively with those professional advisors to increase donor potential and kingdom impact. And then we'll look at some important demographic trends. Here's one from the Center of Wealth and, and Philanthropy. Retired households, on average, own 58% more wealth or assets than do people younger than that, but they earn 35% less income than do non-retired households. On average, they also contribute substantially more, 69%, to charitable causes than do non-retired households. So when you look at giving per capita, giving per donor family. That group is the most generous, at least historically, and they've got more money to give. And it's estimated that donors over the age of 50 could give two to four times as much annually, annually, by gifting from assets instead of just with income or cash and not have it affect their lifestyle. Jeannie talked about uh, a case study of an uh, older donor uh, who had, what, $90 million or something like that, had the capacity to, to give a lot more money away. And um, Jeannie did a great job of telling us about how millennials 
thing. So here's the dilemma that most ministries face. If you look on the left-hand side at what assets are owned, 91% of the assets that, that they own are in the form of other assets, things like real estate, uh, family business, 401ks, assets that are not readily liquid. Only 9% of their assets are in the form of cash. And yet, as several people have pointed out earlier today, when most ministries ask for a gift, what are they asking for? They're expecting somebody to write a check. So it's got to come out of that cash bucket. And, and um, when we look at what assets are given, 94% of the assets given by donors to charities in America are given in the form of cash. Only 6% is given in the form of those other assets. So if we want to unlock that 91% of other assets and get the donors releasing those for kingdom purposes, uh, we need to figure out the, the formula for doing that. So here's the opportunity. With the passing of the builder generation and the aging of the boomer generation, we've already heard this stat earlier, we've already begun the largest wealth transfer in the history of the world. I don't think that we need to belabor that point, but here's the question for each of you in your ministry. Much of that will be unintentionally lost to a state capital gains and IRD taxes, and we believe that that's poor stewardship. And the question is, will your ministry get uh, your share of, of that uh, wealth transfer? The money that is going to estate taxes, capital gains taxes, and IRD, wouldn't you rather see that money converted to kingdom capital instead of going to those other taxes? So there's a number of areas that, that we can help uh, with, and that's in the area of implementation of planned gifts and professional advisor relationships. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip over this one and talk about identifying uh, opportunities. First is with high capacity donors. Uh, I would define them, this is just my, my personal definition, as people with a net worth of over five million dollars. Oftentimes they'll own a family business, farm, or ranch. They have highly appreciated assets, sometimes significant real estate holdings, they have large qualified plans, 401ks, IRAs, annuities. Sometimes they have excess income over lifestyle. And we're going to talk about each of these uh, gift triggers and how, to, how you as a development officer can spot them when you're uh, talking with your donors and how you can engage them in a conversation that will help them think about how to use that for kingdom purposes. The other parts are a desire for kingdom impact and they're excited about your ministry. So you've got the relationship with them. So there are seven significant gift triggers. One is real estate transactions. Obviously, if somebody has highly appreciated real estate and they sell that real estate, they're going to pay capital gains taxes. So the opportunity for you as a ministry in engaging your donors around this is if you can find out and discover that they're in the process of selling a piece of real estate, if you can catch them early enough you can help them to structure that in a charitable way that saves them money in capital gains taxes. The same thing with the sale of a business, avoiding the capital gains tax. Excess income over lifestyle. If you hear donors saying, man, I just had to pay my quarterly estimated taxes and I get killed every time I have to do that. I'm paying, I'm writing checks for $10,000 or $20,000 every quarter for those uh, estimated taxes. That should be a signal to you that they probably have excess income over what their lifestyle requires and they don't like paying the taxes on it. So that's an opportunity to help them lower the income tax. Uh, taxable estate gifts. Uh, we already heard about the $5,450,000 exemption, doubled now with portability. So if they're above approximately $11 million, then there's a big opportunity to save money in, in uh, estate taxes. And then large amounts of corporate stock or stock options. Uh, one of the things that uh, my buddy Sean Wood right here in front of me does a lot of, he, he came out of the high tech industry. So he's got a lot of connections in, the, in Silicon Valley and in the high tech world. And some of those people have stock and stock options that they've been granted by their company. And many uh, of those people, when they get to exercising those or selling stock, they just do it. They don't think about planning around that, about how to mitigate the taxes. They don't think about charitable structures. In fact, in most cases, those clients or donors don't even know there's an opportunity 
to mitigate those taxes. If they knew that there was a way to do that and have that money go to their favorite ministries, like yours, do you think they would rather do that than send it to their least favorite governmental agency, the IRS? In most cases, the answer is yes. So there's great opportunity to help them lower both income and capital gains taxes depending upon what the uh, stock or stock options are. And then large retirement plans, we mentioned that before. Uh, this is probably the biggest opportunity from a plan giving perspective of most ministries in the room, especially if you have aging uh, donors, say over 50, and I put myself in that category. So um, That's a big opportunity because most people are not aware, they don't even know what the IRD tax is, and we'll <coughs> define that more a little bit later on. Most of you in the room probably do. And then unneeded life insurance, and you say, well, man, I haven't heard about that one. Why do people not need their life insurance? Well, there can be many reasons. Oftentimes, they bought the life insurance when the kids were growing up, they had a big mortgage, they wanted to make sure that if, if one of the spouses died early, that there would be enough money there so that the other spouse would be able to make ends meet if they were in a double income family, or to be able to oftentimes have the, the surviving spouse stay at home and raise the children, um, you know, homeschool, Christian school, whatever the case may be, uh, to, to spend more time with the kids. So oftentimes as they get older, and the same thing is true in the business context, oftentimes they have key man life insurance, well the key man is no longer there. He already retired, left, left but they've, they still have that policy. Or maybe it's a buy-sell agreement and that partner has already been bought out. Now what do we do with this life insurance policy that we bought 20 years ago? So that's a great opportunity. We're going to look at what can be done there to help them lower estate taxes and really use that for kingdom purposes. So let's look at each of these uh, I call them gift triggers, and that's what you should begin to think of them as. Whenever you hear a donor talking about these things, kind of a, a, a red light should go off uh, in, in your mind saying, here is an opportunity not to just get a gift, but you've already heard about the heart that we should be having from Jeannie and Joseph and others, Guy, earlier today about, no, how can we help the donor? How can we serve the donor? And if we help them, we know that Oftentimes, uh, we will, our ministry will be blessed and we'll get a gift from that. So, real estate transactions. The goal, to lower current income and capital gains taxes. So, almost weekly, certainly monthly, I get um, either from a client or from a ministry, I get a call or I'm talking with somebody and they say, I'm about to sell this piece of real estate or I've got this client who's about to sell a piece of real estate. I've got two going on in Florida, several going on. Uh, in other parts of the country right now. One in Sarasota, one in Deland, Florida, and then a few up in the, in the Northeast and Midwest. And in those situations, those are opportunities where uh, you can say to, to the donor, if there was a way that I could help you to save money in taxes, and instead of sending it to Washington, you could use it for ministries that are near and dear to your heart for kingdom purposes, would you like to know how to do that? Again, it's a very non-threatening question, no high pressure, uh, but what I found is that just by asking that simple question, most donors will say, yeah, I didn't know that was possible, or yes, I would be interested in finding out more about that. And that tees you up for a conversation. And if, you're, if you personally have the expertise already to have that conversation, great. Engage in the conversation. But if you don't, that's where the Orchard Foundation comes in, because they've got a whole staff of plan giving people uh, attorneys and others who are on staff that can help you come alongside you uh, and that's why many of you in the room are ministry partners of the Orchard Foundation already and if they feel a need to bring in somebody like myself or others then they can do that as well but it's a great opportunity and the benefits to the donor the donor gets a deduction for the fair market value it reduces or eliminates their capital gains tax they get a, the, the tax deduction saves income taxes at the donor's rate, so whatever their rate is, they're gonna save that, federal and state, and ultimately it's more money for ministry. Uh, by the way, this is also a great uh, opportunity for a tool called the Charitable Pool Trust. Uh, if you're familiar with that, especially a young fund type of Charitable Pool Trust, where they can, the donors can get a very high current tax deduction and get an income stream from that much like the, donor, or the uh, charitable gift annuity or the charitable remainder trust that was talked about earlier. But when you look at the, um, the tax savings 
of the charitable pool trust as compared to the charitable remainder trust, it's significantly more in today's um, interest rate environment. So more money for ministry. <clears throat> My passion is not about all the tools, techniques, and strategies. My passion is really uh, about these issues. Number one, I have a passion uh, for Jesus Christ and for the Great Commission. I'm going to ask a question in a minute about what are the two primary components of the Great Commission that people think of when they think of the Great Commission. So you can be noodling on that for a second. Uh, the other uh, is I have a passion for families and for people. Uh, I want to see families connected, intergenerational, not just even parents and, and children. I want to see multiple generations, oftentimes grandparents. I think there's a huge opportunity with the aging of the builder and boomer generation to engage around not just the parents' legacy, but around the grandparents' legacy. I think there's a whole wealth of wisdom and uh, expertise, I'll call it sageness, that is uh, locked up in the, in the hearts and the minds of many grandparents, and they don't oftentimes have an intentional, proactive plan to speak into the lives of their children and grandchildren as part of their legacy. I think there's messages inside them that are welling up, ready to come out, but they haven't even, they're not even aware of that. It's just compressed inside. And you know what? I've found that working with, I'll call it Gen 2, the parents, and Gen 3, the grandchildren, that they need that wisdom. There's life lessons that that previous generation learned that those next generations need. And oftentimes, they want to hear the stories. I'm doing this in my own family. Uh, my wife and I are caregiving for both of our dads. Both of our moms are in heaven now. Kathy's uh, dad is 84. He has Alzheimer's. And when her mom moved, or her mom, yeah, moved, moved to heaven <laughs> about three years ago, uh, her dad already had Alzheimer's. Kathy and I looked at each other when we got the call. And um, I said, your dad can't go home. <laughs> he, he has Alzheimer's. She knew that. We both agreed immediately. There was no choice. He was coming to our home. Um, she has several siblings. They could potentially have taken him in, but you know, her parents lived about an hour or so away from us in uh, Florida. We, had, we were the closest geographically. We were the closest relationally. Uh, we had the largest house, and we were in the best situation financially. It just made common sense. We didn't get any grief from her siblings. They, 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 they appreciate the fact that we're, that we're doing it. Um, and probably one out of the five siblings would have stepped up if, it, if we didn't, but the others probably wouldn't have, okay? So, so, so we're doing that, and, and my dad is starting to, to uh, get frail physically. And so about four weeks ago, uh, we moved him in, into our home as well. So we're caregiving for, uh, for two parents now. And so I have a heart for... Um, for having conversations. I'll call them legacy conversations. I already know a lot about my parents' upbringing and what it was like growing up in the Depression and, and all of that. But just the other night, two nights ago, maybe three nights ago, this week, my dad and I were having a conversation. And I found out things about his upbringing uh, that, that I just totally didn't know. Um, some things that broke my heart that he had to go through and that my grandmother, his mother, had to go through to protect her kids, my dad, and his siblings from their dad, her husband. These are meaningful conversations that will affect the trajectory of my life and our family. And these are the types of conversations that can be and should be had. Again, not just with grandparents, but parents and young people. Those conversations should go both ways. Just as Jeannie talked about that experience with her daughter, what a, what a great way to, I mean, a great example of from just, what, 2012, I think she said, about you know, her daughter on the verge of committing suicide, to now a much healthier relationship and, very frankly, a much healthier daughter and a mom who is way more engaged. That's the type of thing that, very frankly, each of us in this room should be doing with our own families, but it's also the journey that you can be encouraging your donors 
to take their families on. If you don't know how, there are resources here in the room to help with that. So it's not just about the money was my point here. It's, it's, it's about ministry. And if you do your job right, whether you're a gift planner, whether you're an attorney, a financial advisor, or a CPA, if you do your job right, you can see your job as ministry to your donors, not just getting money from your donors to go do ministry. Does that make sense? That's the type of calling and passion that we should have. By the way, I'm going to go back to my Great Commission question. I've given you some time to think about it. What are the two, and I know different denominations have different words for these, and so sometimes this won't work out just right, but what are the two primary uh, components of the Great Commission? Money and people. <laughs> what, do, what do most people think are the two primary? That's a good answer, but what do most people think? The two major components in the Bible for the Great Commission. So discipleship and I, I would put teaching under discipleship. Let's call it evangelism, for lack of a better term. The preaching part, right? Get them saved, disciple them, right? We call it all sorts of different things. But most of the time when people think of the Great Commission, they're thinking something in those two things. Get them saved, grow them up in Christ, right? Teach them the Word. And one of the things that the Lord led me to a number of years ago is that yes, I do believe that those are the two primary components of the Great Commission. So if we view the Great Commission, I'll call it as an engine, the twin pistons of the Great Commission are evangelism and discipleship. But what the church has so often missed in their efforts to do evangelism and discipleship and fulfill the Great Commission is that the fuel that runs the engine of the Great Commission is biblical stewardship and generosity. All three are part of the Great Commission. But most of the time when we hear about the Great Commission, stewardship and generosity are not included in it. I believe that's a failure to completely understand uh, God's plan for redeeming the world. So let's look at a comparison of gifting, uh, in this case, a $200,000 partial interest, uh, either gifting after a sale, so the donor's willing to make a gift after the sale, or before the sale. The sale price of the land is $1 million in both cases. Capital gains tax on the sale, if they uh, gave after the uh, sale, they're going to pay the, the uh, capital gains tax on the whole amount, call it $150,000. They're then going to give $200,000 to ministry. They'll get the tax deduction of $200,000 for that. Depending on their tax bracket, we're estimating they would save $70,000 on the uh, gift, and the amount left to go to the family is $650,000. However, by gifting before the sale, just a partial gift. Now, this isn't a complex gift. This is a partial gift of the real estate prior to the sale occurring. So in that case, it lowers their capital gains tax because they don't pay it, the capital gains tax, on the amount given to charity because charity is the one who then sells that portion of it. So it, it reduces it by $30,000 to $120,000. The amount going to ministry is still $200,000. They still get the $200,000 deduction. They still save the $70,000. But notice that because of that $30,000 savings, there's more money for the family. So we call this um, making a profit by giving it away, right? Now, you may then be able to encourage the family that if they don't need that additional $30,000 to go to their family or in their own uh, pockets, they could make an additional gift to the ministry of $30,000. And then they would get an additional $10,500 of, um, of tax savings there. So tax-wise giving is good stewardship. And that's the type of thing that we need to be able to uh, talk a donor through. If they're looking at a potential real estate transaction, uh, we want to encourage them always, 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 whenever possible, make the gift prior to the sale. Gift trigger number two, the sale of a business. Uh, I mentioned I've got several of these going on right now as well. Um, and we heard earlier, I think it was $7.1, $7.2 trillion uh, of, um, of wealth expected to transfer from the sale of businesses from the baby boomer generation over the next 10 to 15 years. So it's a huge amount of people that are currently over the age of 50 
who are going to be exiting their businesses, either voluntarily through a sale or involuntarily. And so the goal here is to lower current income tax and convert those tax dollars into charitable dollars. I call it converting your social capital to kingdom capital. By the way, that's a phrase that's pretty good to use with donors. Social capital is what the government says you must give back to society in some form. Now the government's default form is in the form of taxes. So you will be a, a philanthropist whether you want to or not. You can be an involuntary philanthropist or a voluntary steward. So would you like to convert your social capital to kingdom capital? And the strategy in this case is again have the donor gift a partial interest or entire interest in their business prior uh, to the sale. And the benefits are the same as a uh, gift of real estate. Now one, sometimes you find out the donor has already made the, the, they've already had the transaction. The business is already sold. I remember a number of years ago I was actually doing uh, an estate planning charitable giving seminar in a church on a Wednesday night. And I talked a little bit about charitable remainder trusts and, and those types of things that were talked about earlier. And I had a lady come up to me uh, right after the service and say, Jeff, that was so great. I learned so much and your timing is perfect. We just closed on the transaction and sold our business today, literally. And I was like, <sighs> now, back then, I didn't have, and we didn't have as many tools in our toolbox as we do today. But one of the opportunities there, even after the fact, is that charitable pooled trust. It's a great opportunity for a very significant tax deduction, very much like a charitable remainder trust, but a much bigger tax deduction. And so there are things that can be done even if the horse is already out of the barn and the sale has already occurred. Now again, it's always better to do it pre-sale, but when you can't do that, it's still good to do it post-sale. So here's a, a, a real life case study of one that I did with one of those major ministries that were mentioned earlier in my bio. Uh, I call this Mr. and Mrs. Business Steward. And this was a, um, a very successful business owner, an auto dealer, dealer had a Lexus and Toyota dealership and uh, basically said, I've already completed plan my planning. Uh, they had two sets of uh, CPAs, one for the business, one for personal. They already had a, an attorney. They already had a financial advisor, insurance agent. And they, and they thought, there's nothing really that you're going to be able to show us. And um, uh, the ministry that brought us in, it was the vice president of development that brought us in. And this is an overview of their situation. Uh, nothing has been changed except for the, the names have been left out. So uh, John, uh, well, names have been changed more correctly. So John was age 72 at the time. Uh, Jane was age 60. They had two children in their mid-20s. Uh, John owned some successful auto dealerships, S Corporation, important thing to note. The offer on the table was worth uh, more than what John thought the corporations were worth. So he wanted to move quickly. His question to me early on, uh, first meeting with the VP of development and myself was, uh, if we were to move forward, this was the first question after we did our presentation, can you do this in 30 days? I said, we can only do it in 30 days if we have your full cooperation and that of all your advisors. If we don't, we can't do it in 30 days. If we do, we can do it in 30 days. So we can do our part. The question is, can everybody else do their part? And he assured us, because he was type A driver, take charge person, that he would make all his people do their part. And so they, again, thought they had the dream team of advisors. These are people passionate about ministry. They've supported uh, this ministry as major donors for many years. And um, John was uh, actually on the board of directors for this major international ministry. And in fact, uh, when his uh, two-term limit rolled off, um, when he had to roll off the board, uh, the, he was so close and his counsel was so valuable to the CEO of the ministry that he didn't want to lose that closeness or that counsel, so he created a new uh, a position for him. I forget what it was called, but it was something like, uh, uh, it wasn't a president's counsel because he was the only guy on it, but it was that type of thing, um, and he was in that role. So super involved in the ministry, super passionate about it. But this was the plan that their CPA and attorneys had signed off on, uh, the current plan. Uh, Post-sale, they would have been making $771,000 a year from the sale of the business. The tax on the sale of the business was uh, just under $3 million, 
combination of income and capital gains taxes. Uh, at death, the family would have received about seven million and federal estate taxes would have been about seven and a half. Now, this was a number of years ago when the estate tax rates and exemptions were different than what they are today, okay? So you're not gonna be able to make these numbers match up with today's rules. They would be different in today's thing. But notice that uh, the 2.9 million, you know what the CPA said about that? He said, you've got enough money to pay the tax. You've made all this money, just pay the tax. Serious, I'm dead serious. That was what the CPA said to him. Um, and he was kind of believing it. I mean, isn't that the American way? You do your thing and you pay, pay the tax. Um, and notice that even though they were super passionate, nothing was going to ministry from that. Now they were gonna keep doing their regular giving as they always had, but nothing from this transaction would have gone to the ministry. And so the plan that we ended up doing for them uh, eliminated uh, the, uh, I the income and capital gains taxes, saving just shy of $3 million. That's not taxes when you die. That's taxes that you would have otherwise paid by April 15th of next year, okay, on this transaction or in this year's quarterlies. Um, the income, because they kept more money from the sale, they could then reinvest more of that money and have more money to live on. Um, and so that would actually take them up, so almost a $200,000 increase in their annual income. Now keep in mind, this was probably 10 years ago, give or take a couple. So that was, not that it's not a lot of money now, but it was more money back then. Uh, but imagine that, $200,000 per year annual income for the rest of your life to the donors. That's a big deal. And zeroed out federal estate taxes. Now again, if you've got a large estate, significantly over $11 million, I'm gonna go on record and say there's no way to eliminate, zero out that tax without using charitable tools. We've got some really good attorneys in the room and uh, these, these are kingdom-minded attorneys. I'm looking at one and Jeannie was one of the other ones. And, um, but, but out there in the, in the world of attorneys, the approach that most would take on this is things like discount valuation, compression techniques to squeeze the tax. You can do that, you can reduce the tax, but if you've got a large enough number above that, call it $11 million, you cannot eliminate it without using charitable tools. Now, the approach of most people in the financial services industry would be a little bit different than that of most of the attorneys and the CPAs who might use compression or discount techniques, their approach is, why don't you buy a life insurance policy to pay that tax? Pay it with discounted dollars. Now I'm not against life insurance and there's a place to use it and we use it when it's appropriate. But we generally use it only as a last resort and when it's the best tool to accomplish the objective. So I wanna make clear I'm not against life insurance. But you know, you've heard the old saying that if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So every person you see is not an opportunity to sell life insurance. It shouldn't be. It's whether or not that's the appropriate thing for them. And so in this case, we zeroed out the, the taxes so that if they wanted to, they could have the entire $18 million going to the family. Now, in this process, we, because of the structuring that we were doing, this was going to result in approximately a $1.4 million current gift to ministry, which was way more than what the ministry had envisioned. When, when, I, when they first brought me in, they were thinking probably if we're really lucky, knowing our relationship with the donor, we can put a project in front of him and with all the money he's gonna make, he'll probably do a two or $300,000 gift. In my analysis with them, really kind of almost on the spot in the very first meeting, I said, you guys are aiming way low. The opportunity here is much larger. Why? Because we were gonna save them approximately 2.9 million in current taxes on the transaction by the structuring. So my, my question to the, to the ministry was, do you think that if we show the donor that we can save them, at that point we were estimating 2.8 million, ended up being a little bit higher than that. But if we can show them how they can save 2.8 million on this, do you think we can get them to give half of that? They were like, oh, oh that, ah, maybe. Um, they were intrigued by it. 
none of them, the, here's the next question they asked me, because the C, neither the CEO, who had a great relationship with them, nor the VP of development, who is a very uh, successful, very sophisticated uh, gift uh, development officer, I mean, he's VP of, okay, and neither of them were willing to make that ask. Their question to me was, Jeff, are you willing to make that ask? <laughs> I said, absolutely. I have no problem. If I can show a donor how to save 2.8 million, I have no problem asking them, would you be willing to consider giving half of that to the kingdom? And in most cases, they'll say yes. What's the worst case? They say no. They still make a 300,000 or maybe they make a $700,000 gift. We're way ahead of the game. But that, that was the opportunity. Now, you may look at this and go, well, how can they give 18 million to, uh, to uh, their family and have 15 million going uh, to, to ministry down the road when they die, um, when approximately they probably only had a, I forget what the amount of the net worth was, call it 18 million, 20 million, I forget what it was. And, and the reason is because of the leverage, there were two leverages here. One was the leverage of charitable tools, and the other was, in this case, leverage of life insurance. Not life insurance to pay the tax, because I think that's, forgive me if any insurance agents are in the room, I think that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard, to use life insurance to pay the tax. I would much rather show them how to eliminate the tax and then, if necessary, use life insurance to replace the wealth that was given to the kingdom tax-free to the kids. Make sense? Because in one case, the IRS still gets their money from your life insurance. In the other case, the kingdom gets your money and your kids get your tax-free life insurance. By the way, your kids like tax-free money way better than they like taxable money. <laughs> and so do your grandkids, right? So real life example of the type of thing that if you can catch a business owner at a place where they're ready to make a transaction, you can do some significant, uh, provide significant benefit for them. Excess income over lifestyle. Um, here is the goal is to maximize the 50% AGI limitation by combining cash gifts and asset gifts. Move some of the income off your personal tax return and get it going directly to a charitable entity so that that isn't then affected by your 50% AGI limitation. The benefits to the donor, it maximizes their current income tax deduction, which many of them are not maximizing because their CPAs oftentimes don't think that way. And um, so that's helpful. The tax deduction saves the income taxes at the donor's rate and it can increase the donor's cash flow if done with non-liquid uh, assets. Um, we were just working on a case that we delivered last week up in a, I'll call it a northeastern state, where the donor is already super generous. Last year they gave nine and a half million dollars away to Kingdom Purposes. Now they did that by primarily writing a check. 700,000 was from marketable securities, but that, that was it. But they own a business that is really the goose that lays the golden eggs. It's the engine that creates all that income and very frankly the wealth. And so one of the things we showed them uh, is how to begin giving pieces of that business away now, asset-based giving instead of cash giving. And uh, Sean saw this and I think Jenny saw this. We kind of extrapolated that out over the next 20 years for them and the amounts were huge. It went from, in their case, $250 million of giving over that 20-year uh, period, and, and including if they died during, yeah, at the end of that, to just under $1 billion. It was $900 million and change. The difference between asset-based giving and cash giving, and using the business as an engine of blessing, using the business to fuel, to fund the Great Commission. So it's a great, great opportunity. Here's a, a real life example. Uh, we call her Mrs. Current Giver. She, when I first met her, was a single lady in her early 50s with no children. She was from the west coast of the United States. So the ministry uh, really, I'm trying to think, all my conversations with her initially were over the phone because she was in California, and, which is a big state, so you can't figure out where or who she was. Right, and they've only got a couple of people in California. That, so, and, but, so it, was, it was actually deep into the process before she made a trip to the ministry headquarters and I actually met with her. 
So she had built a sizable business that produced a large amount of free cash flow, and she wants to use the business and the income that she's been blessed with to help fund ministry work. She's already done good charitable estate planning, uh, benefiting the ministry. In fact, again, it was the, uh, uh, the vice president of plan giving, the head of the foundation that brought me in uh, on this. And um, so he had already helped her with that. Her CPA is saying, don't give any more because you can't deduct it. He was like, don't, don't keep doing that because you can't deduct it. His whole thing was, can you deduct it? He didn't understand her heart. She didn't really care about the deduction. She wanted more money to go to ministry. But her questions were, as a single lady in her 50s, how much is enough and do I currently have enough or do I need to invest more money for my own financial future? She didn't have clarity about that. She had some people that I, I wouldn't really call them financial advisors, but she had some people that were mutual fund salespeople and annuity salespeople who had sold her some stuff, but they had never really done any retirement planning. So she had no real frame of reference. She knew she had this pot of money that she'd been saving for, but she didn't, didn't know if it was enough to uh, cover her uh, financial future. And then the question is, how much more, this was her question, how much more can I afford to give during my lifetime without risking running out of money later on during life? And how can I do that all tax efficiently? So if that was your mission, if you were put in front of that donor, how would you help her? What are some of the things? Just shout them out. Nobody wants to go on record. That's all right. So step one was a financial freedom analysis, helping her to determine what her level of income needed to live at the level of lifestyle that she believed God wanted her to live, which was not excessive for the amount of money that she made. And, um, and then taking a look at her existing assets and helping her plot that out using inflation, and rates of return, and taxes, and so forth, to help her to see, am I on track? Do I need to save more money? Or am I already all set? In her case, she was already all set. So we encouraged her to do gifting from highly appreciated stock, i.e. the business, instead of just from cash or, or income. Um, from, actually, that was from her portfolio of investments. The second part was gifting shares of the corporate entity to, to ministry to do future giving from the business instead of from her personal 1040, which again uh, avoids the 50% AGI limitation. So here was the situation. Her current plan, she had 500,000. She had a couple of relatives. She was single, no kids. But she had a couple of relatives that she wanted to take care of at a certain level if she passed away. So that was 500,000. She had already locked that down before I ever e even entered the equation. There was no uh, taxes in the situation because her estate wasn't large enough. But notice on the right-hand side the impact of what we did for ministry. So hers was not so much tax-driven. Um, it wasn't family-driven because there, there weren't, wasn't a whole lot of family. But it, it increased over the lifetime of her giving uh, $3.4 million additional going to ministry over her lifetime from the amount of increased current giving that she would be able to do. And the income tax savings on that projected over her lifetime, so she wasn't like a mega $100 million type of person, but that saved $1.2 million projected over the balance of her life. How many of you think that's a win for the kingdom, right? And it's using that business as a wise steward for kingdom purposes. Okay, and donors with a taxable estate. I'm a big believer in zero estate tax planning. I hate people paying estate taxes. I think rarely should that occur. So uh, one strategy is to, get, if you have life insurance, give life insurance to the heirs and give assets to charity instead of the way they were doing it before. Uh, let's see, is there, yep. Yeah. So oftentimes uh, people have money going to ministry from their will or their living trust. They'll, they'll say, I want to give 10% to charity from the will or living trust. Nothing wrong with that. But if they then have things like IRAs or other things that are going to the kids, then they're giving money that would otherwise you know, potentially be tax-free to the kids that might get a step up in cost basis. Uh, and then they're giving taxable money to the, to the kids, IRD 
uh, thing. So consider a, a charitable trust. Oftentimes a laddered charitable lead trust is a great strategy. It depends on what the assets are and whether or not it's a, uh, it's a good fit. But that's a great tool even to use as a safety net to create a zero estate tax. If, if you're concerned about changing estate tax laws, and you should be because they change almost with every change in the administration, uh, or if you're concerned about changing asset values, a, ch a laddered testamentary charitable lead trust can be a great kind of safety net. And then make the charity the beneficiary of the IRA assets. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later on. And the benefits to the donor are lower estate taxes, potentially double the charitable giving at death, and pass on more assets to heirs both during and after life. We mentioned earlier the donors that have large amounts of corporate stock or stock options. And there's a lot of people like this out here. I remember way back, the, the first at least decent sized one of these that I dealt with was way back when UPS was a private company uh, and they were about to go public. And there were a lot of employees who had received UPS stock back when it was private that now that it was going public, uh, they, were, they were becoming instant millionaires, multi-millionaires, people that were truck drivers before that. Um, they had made, you know, because UPS is, if you're a truck driver, they pay pretty good. Uh, but still, people that made thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, but now like several million dollars because of that IPO uh, that, that they didn't have before. And we saw the same thing a few years later with Home Depot and Lowe's and some of those companies. And again, uh, high-tech industry is one where it's really popular right now. And so you've got donors in your donor base that have this situation. And if they just sell those or they exercise the options without wise planning, they're going to pay unnecessary capital gains and income taxes. So again, one of the options is make any charitable gifts pre-sale when possible to avoid the capital gains tax on those assets. Number two, use split income charitable gifts like the charitable remainder trust or charitable gift annuity or the charitable pool trust uh, as an option when appropriate to provide income to the donors as well as tax savings. You see, sometimes donors know they don't need the money. They, they know they don't need income, in which case you can do an outright gift to charity or, or these types of things. But sometimes donors do need income off it. They can't just afford to give it away. Um, and sometimes they may not need it, but they don't know that and their confidence level isn't high enough yet for them to pull the trigger on a full outright gift. So that's where these split interest gifts where the donor gets some income, but they're making a gift to charity come into play. Use inter vivos charitable lead trusts and donor advised funds to pre-fund future giving. Next week I'll be in Dallas, I'll be seeing a client uh, down there who uh, his situation wasn't so much corporate stock, but rather he was a high level executive, he was a VP, and last year, he, uh, he took a, a severance package that was really sweet, but it was going to mean a ton of income all in 2015. I mean, he already made a good income, but it was like 5x, 10x, right? And so we use some of these strategies here, uh, InterVivo's Charitable Lead Trust, and simply prefunding uh, your charitable giving. So one of the things we did in his situation, he wants to, even after retirement, he and his wife want to continue to give, in their case, $50,000 a year to charity. That's what they've been giving. That's what they, they want to keep doing. They, they can afford it, and they want to do that. So in this case, we looked at, well, you know, yeah, you could just keep doing that, but why not take 250000 of that and pre-fund five years of that, but do it this year when you need the tax deduction most? Right? I mean, it's simple, but it's so simple that people don't think about it. And it's so simple that donors don't know about it, even smart guys. This guy's a CFA, Charter Financial Analyst. He's a bright guy. <laughs> okay? um, he's got attorneys and CPAs. None of them thought of this. Why? Because they don't think oftentimes charitably, unless you have a really good attorney like Karen over here who thinks charitably, okay? because she's in both of those worlds. But your typical attorney or your typical CPA or financial advisor, sometimes they don't even know what uh, an inter vivos charitable lead trust is. In fact, <laughs> I have a quiz. We won't do it here. But one of my quizzes for plan giving people who, uh, or for that matter, for professional advisors that think they uh, 
who kind of act like they know what they're talking about, but if I'm not really sure, they do. Um, I have some, uh, several questions around charitable lead trusts uh, that I ask them, and if you get with me afterwards, I'll ask you. There's four questions, and in the span of about 30 seconds, you can find out if somebody knows what they're talking about or if they don't, anyway, just for free. So the benefit to the donors, lower capital gains taxes, lower income taxes, and uh, quantifiable future income streams through those uh, split interest gift tools. So why stewardship through halftime and beyond? So this is, a, this is not that same guy from last year. This is from a few years ago. I just communicated with this uh, guy today. He's a, a client of, uh, continues to be a client of ours. He was VP of uh, operations for a Fortune 100 company. Uh, he's not mega wealthy, but he's you know, reasonably wealthy. His total estate at that time was valued at about 7.5 million. He had stock options valued at 2.5 million. His 401k and IRA assets out of the 7.5 uh, were 1.2. And one of the questions that they had was, how much is enough? Uh, can I afford to retire early? Because he was in his kind of early, uh, mid-50s. Um, if I do, then what? So that's why I call him the halftime steward, because those of you who are familiar with the halftime institute and halftime coaching, he was struggling with that. If I, if I, all I've ever known since I was a teenager is work, and I've worked my way up. I'm the VP of this Fortune 100 company. I've got a great position. I've got a bunch of people reporting to me. The entire southeast of the United States for this Fortune 100 company reported to him. So it was a you know, pretty prestigious, pretty powerful position, decent, you know, good income. And, but then, then what was his question? And then they had blended family issues because it was a second marriage. So he had his kids. Uh, she had uh, her daughter and um, some grandkids on the way. And they wanted to know how do we navigate that? He definitely wanted to take care of his wife. He definitely wanted to take care of his kids. He definitely, in his situation, wanted the majority of his assets that he, the wealth that he had created, um, to go to his kids, not her kids. He wasn't opposed to giving something to her kids, but, but it, equal wasn't gonna happen with him, and he's type A, hard-charging kind of guy. And, um, the wife, spirit-filled, loves him, loves the Lord, you know, and yet she's struggling with this inside uh, a little bit. Um, she, she wants to make sure her kids are taken care of, uh, her daughter uh, as well, and so helped him to navigate these uh, issues. And ultimately, even though they were committed Christians, they had never really understood the concept of stewardship. They had never really understood God is the owner of it all, and we are his stewards. Now, we in this room take that for granted. But if you look at churches around America, and including donors, some of the donors in your donor base, don't assume that all of them have that same understanding that you and I do about that issue. Well, many of them have never heard it, because although it's gotten better in the last 10 years or so, historically, many pastors, money is the topic they didn't want to talk about. So this whole idea is relatively new in terms of its resurgence in, uh, in the church. So we help them to quantify how much is enough. We help them navigate complex uh, stock option decisions. And it, originally when he approached us, that was his number one thing. I want you to help me to navigate that. He wasn't even really con concerned initially around these other more holistic issues until I started asking some questions that got him and her thinking. We then created a new estate plan with those latter testamentary charitable lead trusts to provide flexibility to changing tax law and asset values and all assets above the combined estate tax exemption, whatever that may be at the time of their death, will go to charity through the latter TCLATs and also through their donor advised fund. And um, at that time that we implemented that, that was estimated to be three and a half million dollars going to the kingdom. Now keep in mind, all that's testamentary. But still, you'll take a planned gift better, better than no gift, right? How, ma how many of you wouldn't mind getting a planned gift of three and a half million? Okay. <laughs> Utilize their 1.2 million of 401k and IRA assets wisely by directing them uh, to charity upon the spouse's death. So the spouse will be taken care of with those assets, but the contingent beneficiary is charity. 
which is their donor advice fund actually, and it would go out to various ministries including their church. Again, that's one that even though they had a CPA, and the CPA is a good friend of mine, I had introduced him to the CPA because he had the horsepower to help him get it done, but that wasn't on his radar. That's not something he would have come up with. Very frankly, it's not something that the estate attorney, estate planning attorney that they were using would have come, did come up with or would have come up <laughs> with either. But we brought up the idea and they loved it. Help them cast a vision for what they can do with their time, talents, and treasures in halftime, which for them is now. And that was probably, that was back in probably 07 that, that I started work with them. So now, you know, they're deep into that. They're doing some family legacy stuff and, and ministry stuff and assisted them in developing an, what I call an intentional and proactive plan for their family legacy. That's a key uh, phrase, intentional and proactive. Because if you ask people, do you want to have a strong and lasting family legacy, everybody will say yes. If you ask them, do you have an intentional, proactive plan for making that happen, for mentoring and discipling your children and grandchildren? for passing on the wisdom and life lessons that you've learned. Do you have an intentional, proactive plan for doing that? I've been asking that question for about 15, 20 years now, and seldom do I get an affirmative answer. But it resonates with people. They know they should do it, and now they want to find out how. We'll have a time for Q&A a little bit later. We're going to have a panel discussion. So if you've got questions, write them down or remember them. We're going to have a, pa a panel discussion later on. So. Here's the numbers in their situation. Uh, under the current plan, five and a half million would go to the family, uh, 1.5 million to federal estate taxes, and 420,000 to IRD taxes, zero to ministry, even though they were committed Christians. Now keep in mind, again, different tax laws than 2016. Under the stewardship plan, four million would go to the family, zero to federal estate taxes, zero to IRD, saving the family almost $2 million and ministry would end up getting about three and a half million dollars. So again, you see that this is, I think the paradigm that most Americans, we'll call them donors, have and most professional advisors is, they see charity as being in competition with the family. I would, I would submit to you that is absolutely not the case. It's not charity versus family. It's charity versus your least favorite governmental agency, the one that you hate writing checks to the one that you open the envelope with fear and trembling when it comes in. If, if you're like me, you, you get those and you don't know, are you going to get an audit? Now, we've survived our audits, but we st it's still not a comfortable feeling. I don't have a high blood pressure problem, but I do when I get those envelopes, right? So what are the best and worst assets to give to family and charity? And this is something that I think should be top of mind, back of hand for everyone who's involved in planned giving or for every professional advisor. Um, and so what are those? And um, what are the best assets to give to family upon death? And what are the worst assets to give to them? And same questions related to charity. So donors with large IRAs and 401ks, the goal here is avoid IRD tax. Most of you in the room are probably familiar with it, but just for those that are not, IRD stands for Income in Respect of the Decedent. Uh, basically, it's the income tax that your heirs will pay on tax-deferred uh, investments like IRAs, 401ks, and some other things, U.S. savings bonds, and so forth. I like to call it not income in respect of the decedent, but income in disrespect of the decedent, okay? <laughs> because it's like the slap in the face for all that good saving and working that you did planning for retirement. It's the ultimate slap. What happens in too many cases is your beneficiaries will get this large amount from the 401k or IRA, and it will pop them into the highest marginal tax bracket, and they'll pay 40% plus whatever state income tax is. So on your million dollar IRA or 401k, oftentimes your kids will lose 400,000 of it, and only 600,000 will end up getting into your kids' hands. So it's, in my opinion, the worst asset to give uh, to, to kids and somebody would say, well, they could do a stretch. Here's the deal. How many people do a stretch? Nobody. How many of you uh, remember the quote from Cuba Gooding Jr. in Jerry Maguire? Show me the money. So when the beneficiaries have the option of taking the million dollars or taking it over time, what do you think they do? 
They take it all in a lump sum in most cases. It would be a rare person. So, so they don't avoid the tax in that. They don't even stretch out the tax. They get whacked. And so if you want to avoid them getting whacked, don't give that asset to your kids in most cases. But it must be done. Uh, at, so make charity the beneficiary of the uh, IRA assets or 401k after the spouse. Must be done at death in order to avoid taxation to the donor. That's something we run into oftentimes. Donors will hear about that. And some plan giving people, if, if they're somewhat knowledgeable but not enough knowledgeable, they sometimes don't know you can't take it from the IRA uh, or the, or the non-qualified annuity. Now, we do have the, I'll call it new rule, it's been around for a while, but it, we just weren't sure where it would go, which is the qualified charitable distributions. And that ought to be something, if you've got donors over the age of 50, every year starting in about I mean, August or September, you ought to be having conversations with them throughout the balance of that year for donors, especially donors over the age of 70 and a half who are subject to required minimum distributions because now they've made the law, quote, permanent. I say quote because they can change it. But, but unlike other years where we've had to kind of wonder, is, are they going to reenact the rule or whatever, donors can do that. And they can do up to $100,000 per year per spouse. So that's $200,000 a year that they can give from their IRA and do it in a tax efficient manner. Um, so it's a great, uh, great opportunity. And, uh, and gift the non-retirement or income tax-free assets to the family. Remember, kids and grandkids would always rather have tax-free assets, assets that get a step up in basis, rather than taxable assets. So this is one, I call it, I forgot about the IRA assets. And we call this the Charitable IRA Rescue Plan. Works with 403Bs and 401Ks as well. So real life example, clients were in their early 70s, two children in their mid 40s. Here's the deal, the client was an experienced development officer. He was vice president of the organization in the area of plan giving and development. They're very charitable. During their lifetime, they've already given over two million. And they were doing that on a ministry salary. Okay, so they're, they're passionate. They already had a good estate plan. They thought that it was a zero tax plan, but in our review and value proposition summary to them, we discovered that they had overlooked the IR, IRD issues. We also then discovered that they had f some family relationship issues um, with one of their daughters. And um, so we were able to get involved in, in by God's grace and, and, and through uh, some facilitation that we did, they ultimately had healing take place between them and their daughter. So that was way more important to them than the money. That wasn't even on their radar. It wasn't even something that they had admitted uh, between themselves. They didn't, it was, it was, you know, their favorite river was denial, right? They, it, was, it was the thing that nobody spoke about. And um, so here were the numbers. Uh, again, not a wealthy uh, family, but 1.1 million would have gone to the family no estate taxes because it was a relatively small estate, but 255,000 would have gone to IRD taxes. You should have seen this guy's face because again, experienced VP of development literally hit his head and said, I forgot him. Now, it technically wasn't IRA, it was 403B because he was part of the ministry, but same deal. Um, and so we showed him how to structure that in a way where they could eliminate that by gifting those IRD assets to ministry directly uh, upon the death of the second spouse and uh, replace those assets. This was a place where life insurance made sense because they were going to give a big chunk of their estate to ministry by giving those 403B assets away. 730,000 on a, you know, a state of what, a couple million or something like that? No, 1.4. So roughly half of, half of it was, was those uh, assets. So they wanted to replace that. And uh, they were already taking RMDs. We showed them how to take those RMDs that they weren't using anyway, and that was used to fund the life insurance to give tax-free money to the kids, which they loved. So donors with old, unneeded life insurance policies, I'm going to fast forward here and uh, tell you about Mrs. Philanthropic. She was a widow in her uh, uh, early 70s. Her estate was valued at $8.4 million. She had one daughter and four grandsons. Very kingdom-minded, major donor of the ministry that brought me in. Her first big struggle was the dysfunctional history with her daughter. 
When I say dysfunctional, here's what I mean. When her husband had passed away a number of years before, he had left a trust for her and a trust for their daughter, and he had named her, the mom, as trustee over the trust for the daughter. And the daughter didn't want to wait for the terms of the trust to get at her money, her money. So she sued her mother, who was the trustee, to try to bust the trust. Now she did bust the trust, meaning she busted the trust relationship between her and her mom, but she wasn't successful at busting the trust itself. So she felt conflicted. She wanted to make, in her words, some provision for her daughter, but she wasn't sure, number one, should she, <laughs> given what had transpired, and if she did, she didn't know how much. What she did know is this. If she gave her an inheritance, she didn't want to give her a large lump sum and wanted it from, protected from potential bad decisions. Her exact words were marrying another scoundrel. She didn't, her daughter had been married several times. She was currently living with somebody else. And so she wanted to make sure if she left something to her daughter that it didn't end up in the hands of an idiot. She also wanted to give an inheritance to her grandsons but wasn't sure about the prodigal. So she had four grandsons. One was like the perfect grandson, uh, actually studying to become an attorney, going to Stetson University School of Law at the time, and uh, two others that were pretty good, but one that was just beginning to show some of the tendencies of his mom, her daughter. And so her second big struggle was, if I do this type of plan, this was her barrier. She knew for several years that she had an estate tax problem and that her estate was a mess. She knew that. But her, her barriers were she couldn't figure out what she wanted to do. Nobody was there to navigate her through all the issues. And second, she was like, who, who do I name as trustee if I, if I do this? Because if my daughter will sue me, she'll sue the next one. So here's what we did. First of all, we assisted her in thinking through the emotional, relational, and financial issues related to her daughter's inheritance. When I say that, First of all, there had been some healing and reconciliation that had occurred. She had been intentional. Now, it wasn't a fully healed relationship by any way, shape, or form. It was still very bad, very dysfunctional. But it was better than what it was back at the time the daughter had sued her. But her daughter did not know Jesus Christ as her Savior. And one of the things that we talked about was if she disinherited her daughter entirely, now keep it in mind, her daughter still would get some from her dad's trust. But if she didn't give her anything, if she disinherited her, would that drive her daughter further away from Christ? Or would it be better to give her an inheritance, not to try to buy her salvation or anything like that, but to not further alienate her daughter? So this wasn't just an emotional, relational, financial struggle. This was a spiritual struggle for her. And she ultimately made the decision, kind of like what Jeannie was saying before. I love the way she put the, the stewardship of relationships comes over the stewardship of resources. I love the way she put that. And that, I wish I had that sound bite back then. I didn't, but we talked her through that. And she ultimately determined that even if her daughter squandered the money she was going to give her. Now, keep in mind, we, she wasn't going to end up giving her a boatload of money, and we were going to put some protective borders around it. But... But, um, but she ultimately determined that the potential of her daughter's eternal destiny was more important than the money and the stuff. And we agreed, the VP of development and myself totally agreed. We then helped her answer the question of how much is enough for her daughter and her grandsons. And we kind of backed into it. She looked at it in terms of an amount of income that she wanted to be able to have them get. And so that's why you see an audience an $850,000 testamentary charitable remainder trust. Why a, uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. So, and then a $450,000 testamentary CRT for each of the grandsons. So none of, the, none of them would actually get triggered until her death. They were provisions within her living trust. But here's what she liked about that idea. The CRT provided what I call protected provision. It protects it for the beneficiary. In other words, if they have a lawsuit or a creditor, or an ex-spouse come after them, they can't get out that money. It's in an irrevocable trust that, that the income beneficiary doesn't have control over. So it's protected uh, uh, for them 
But she also liked the fact that it's protected from them. The daughter couldn't just go in and screw with it, nor if the grandson who was a prodigal ended up really going prodigal, he couldn't, he couldn't mess with it either. So she loved that idea. By the way, if you haven't written that one down, you probably ought to, because that's a way, that's a term that resonates with donors. Protective provision protects it for them and from them. We also provided creative solutions for the successor trustee and the situs of the trust. We helped her think through every, everybody that she knows, all the people in her church, friends, family. Uh, her uh, statement to the VP of Development and myself was, all the people that I know and trust, all my cronies are my age. Okay? I don't know anybody your age that I trust and, or, or younger. And, um, and you know, we, we can't serve as trustee and, and um, the charity could serve as the trustee, but they wisely, they, we, we actually had a meeting with them and, and their gift acceptance policy and the, the foundation and all that, and they determined, no, we don't want to do that. If she's willing to sue her mom, we don't want to be in that line of fire wisely. And we, we, weren't, we weren't recommending that either. So, um, so in this situation, we were bringing in a really super highly competent Christian estate planning attorney who was going to be drafting all of the documents, the CRTs and the Living Trust and all of that. And we felt like there was probably nobody in a better position to serve as the trustee than him. Because he would have all of his legal notes from all of the discussions and the VP of development who had had a 13 year relationship with her as a donor, really deep relationship, he would have all his notes and very frankly I would have all my notes and I'm an avid note taker. So we felt if, if if, we were, if the attorney was ever sued, if, the trust, if they ever tried to bust it, that um, between the attorney, the VP of development, and myself, if, if it could be defended, we could defend it. But we put a little hook in there, um, which was uh, my idea. Um, and the hook was that we had a Delaware trust company um, as a backup trustee to the attorney. And a provision for change of situs, if that were to occur. This was in Florida. So uh, what would happen is if they tried to bust the trust, if there was a lawsuit against the attorney as trustee, we would kind of let them run in the discovery process. Let them build up that big bill. Let them build up their hopes. Okay, because remember the attorney on the other side is thinking he's going to get 30 or 40% of it, right? Keep in mind, it's in Florida, so they would have hired a Florida attorney to bring that lawsuit. And so we would let them run with that. And then if it, you know, came down to it, um, the attorney would resign as trustee, situs would change from Florida to Delaware, trust company in Delaware would take over, and they would have to start fighting that battle all over again in the state of Delaware, small state, few attorneys, very expensive, and with some of the best trust laws in the nation to support trusts and trustees. And oh, by the way, that attorney who spent all that time probably wouldn't be licensed in Delaware. <laughs> so he's now or she's now not motivated for 30 or 40 percent of nothing. So donor loved that, VP of the ministry loved that, and uh, that's what we did for this lady. So the current plan had 5.5 million, by the way, all going to her daughter. Remember, she had that old will that she hadn't updated because she couldn't figure all these things out. 5.5 million going to the daughter. Nothing to the grandkids, nothing to the kingdom. Federal estate taxes would have been two and a half million, IRD taxes, 400, so call it three million altogether. But under our plan, with the testamentary CRTs for the grandsons and the, and the son, it would be roughly 3.2 million. Now keep in mind, that's over time. They wouldn't get it all at once. And uh, zeroed out the taxes, saving almost three million dollars. But immediately upon her death, 4.8 million would go as an outright gift to ministry. And then later on down the road, as the uh, daughter and grandsons ultimately passed away, uh, those, those amounts, that's the 3.8 million that you see there in deferred gifts. So a huge win for the kingdom. But then the question was, Jeff, I had this $1.2 million that these life insurance agents sold me to pay the taxes, estate taxes, a few years ago. Now I have a zero estate tax plan. What should I do with the life insurance? So we looked at it, she could cash it in. It had 300,000 of cash value. Could have put that into investments. But she had 8.4 million and was 73 years old. She didn't need it. So uh, the ministry guy um, said, 
if you want, you could name our ministry as the charitable beneficiary. She loved that idea. She was willing to keep on paying the premiums. I said, these were my exact words, just like the Apostle Paul said, there is a more excellent way. And so I shared with them how she could gift the ownership of that life insurance policy, not just change the beneficiary, gift the ownership of the policy to the charity now, irrevocably, and um, get a current income tax deduction for that gift, which was approximately $300,000. So, um, so it actually uh, doesn't show it here, but we saved her $105,000. That was the taxes saved by that charitable gift of the life insurance policy. And now she's paying those premiums. Now, I say paying the premiums. There were $36,000 a year, by the way, I remember those numbers. She used to write the check to the insurance company. Who she write the check to now? Charity. Charity, right? It's not a premium, it's a gift. And at her tax bracket, that saves her $12,000 every year for the rest of her life. Cool thing, right? And 1.6 going to the ministry. So um, the point here, and you'll have all the notes, is that there are these gift triggers that if you're talking with donors and you hear them say, thinking about selling my real estate, thinking about selling my business, I'm getting squeezed with income taxes. There, those are opportunities to spot that gift trigger and say, hey, we've got a way to help you. If you would rather have some of that go to the kingdom, would you like me to show you how or introduce you to somebody that could? So thank you uh, for your time today.